Good morning. It's Wednesday. I'm Wayne. Welcome to Wisdoms with Wayne, brought to you by the Real Estate Business School, where you get your license and learn to use it. What does that mean? It means that every year, tens of thousands of people get into the real estate business. It also means every year, tens of thousands of people leave. They leave because the license guarantees you nothing, but most schools don't want you to know that. Their, their intent is to get you licensed, but there's more to real estate than just getting a license. For example, I've been on hundreds of listing presentations, and no one has ever asked me the difference between accretion and erosion, or how many square feet are in an acre. So what do your clients, especially your sellers, want to know? They want to know if you can market the home. They want to know if you can sell it for top dollar. And they usually want to know if you can negotiate best price and terms for them. Well, these are business skills. So when I say there's more to real estate than getting a license, that's what I mean. To, to get a license requires a technical education, math formulas, a new language, contracts. It's very technical and it's a good foundation and you need it. All I'm saying is, and the reason you need it is because most of the complaints to the Real Estate Commission and the lawsuits from lawyers come from contract disputes because most agents haven't taken the time to improve their technical education to the point where they understand how those contracts read, how to fill them out, how to execute them, and how to follow them. And so it's very technical, and it's great. It's a good foundation, but <laughs> I've never – I've been on, I don't know – 800 probably transactions, 500 listing presentations. And no one has, I have not had a seller yet look across the table at me and say, you know, Wayne, we like what we hear. It's obvious you're experienced and do know what you're doing. Um, but tell me, what was your state exam score? <laughs> no one's ever asked me that. I mean, I owe the bank a bunch of money. They've never asked me for my report card, so they don't care. So my point is we need a technical education. We also need a business education. Marketing, sales, negotiations are business skills. And so that's what we teach. That's why we're called the Real Estate Business School, because real estate is a business. If someone tells you it's a career, it's not a career, it's not a job, it's a business. If someone tells you you need six months of income before you get in real estate, you're talking to the wrong school. Okay. If it doesn't take you six months, it takes you 10 days. We'll have you up and running in 10 days by teaching you the skills of business, not just technical information. If you want to get rich in real estate and stop working and still have money coming in, obviously that's passive income. That comes from real estate investing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, requires a financial education. So we teach all three. The technical education required to get a license, the business education your clients expect you to have, and the financial education you need to become independently wealthy by acquiring real estate. That's it, Real Estate Business School. That's the sponsor of today's program. And what we're going into today is recovering the business blueprint, which shows the six components of a business and the definition and goal of each. Here, I'll get you one. And here it is. So this shows the six components of the business, marketing, sales, production, customer service, bookkeeping, and accounting. And then it shows the definition and goal of each. This will soon be online, so you can, you can uh, access this and study at your own pace and your own time in your home, 24-7, 365. Marketing is the number one skill to have. The reason why is most people don't like salespeople. If the marketing is poor, the sell is hard. If the marketing is good, the sell is easy. So what business are you in? Education. So what we going, went over last week uh, what were the three of the four marketing tools. And this week we're going to over, go over the four-step marketing formula. So once you understand the tools and once you understand the formula, then generating leads becomes easy. So I'll start with a quote by Peter Drucker. And for you then, I want to thank you for your time, as always. And I do that because a long time ago, as you've heard me say, a good friend of mine told me the most valuable thing anyone can give you is their time. So thank you for your time. I appreciate you showing up. I'll do my best to make sure your time is well spent. Thank you for being here. This is what Peter Drucker said about marketing. Because its purpose is to create a customer, the business has two and only two functions, innovation and marketing. Innovation and marketing alone produce results. All the rest are costs. So when you think about marketing, and this is the way I see it, you're actually in two businesses. Your marketing component is one business, and whatever your product or service is, is your other business. 
That's how much attention we pay to marketing. That's how big it is. It's like doing in two businesses at the same time. So start with, I want to ask you to start with this. That's what I call lifetime value. I know if you're a lender, you probably think it's loan to value. And it is. What's lifetime value? What's the lifetime value of a customer? So this is about making a transition from being transaction driven to relationship driven. It's about building a business and build your business is the most misused phrase in all real estate training. And the reason why is because if you understand what the person is saying, who says build your business, I'm going to help you build your business, grow your business. What you're talking about marketing, they're referring to marketing. Marketing, what they really mean is I'm going to help you increase the amount of your business. This does no good to an agent who doesn't understand business because they're working by themselves, doing everything on their own. And if it is to be, it's up to me. If you want it done the right way, you got to do it yourself. And nobody does it better than me. This is how they think. And this is why they're stuck because the, the worst place you can be is sole proprietor. This is a business, six components, definition, goal of each. And so when you talk to someone who's stuck in production, who can't, who has no spare time and runs late everywhere. And you're talking about increasing the amount of their business <laughs> it doesn't do any good. So when we talk about building a business, we're talking about building a business, not increasing the amount of your business. So m grow your business is the most misused phrase. So when you understand, when you hear that, listen carefully to what the person is saying to you and see if they're talking about building your business or if it's a marketing function. Typically it's a marketing function which is great because marketing is the most important skill to have. So when you look at lifetime value, you got to mentally make this transition from being employee to employer, how to build a good business, not just how to be a good employee. And it starts with marketing. And the reason that marketing is most important, because as I said, if your marketing is good, sell is easy. If your marketing is weak, the sell is hard. The problem with that is most people don't like salespeople. I don't think people want to be sold. They want to be educated so they can choose. So what business are you in? Education. No matter what your business, your true core product or service is, if you don't have an educational component where you're teaching people what you do, how you do it, why you do it that way, and most importantly, the benefit to them, they're just not going to do business with you because you haven't answered their question, which is, what's in it for me? Why should I do business with you? And why should I give you my money? So the first question you ask when you start marketing is, who has my money? You got to ask that question. You got to figure out your demographic, your geographic, your social graphic. Who is your target market? And design the ads to go after them. So the difference between an ad and an announcement, and that's what we're going to go through today. So we start with lifetime value. And it's amazing to me, one of the first formulas New Age's figure out how to calculate is their commission. You take a $500,000 house and they get half of 6%, 3 they take that, they split with their broker. So if they get a 3% fee and then a 70-30 split, they can pretty quickly get to the point where they're making fifty-two fifty on this transaction, $5,250. They can do that fairly quickly, but lifetime value, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little trickier. So here's how you calculate lifetime value. If you want, if you want this, email me, I'll send you this form. All you have to do is simply take um, the value. What is the value of one client? Well, let's look at it. Let's say the uh, average sales price. Let's say it's 250000 And you multiply that times the 3% fee you're going to get, which is 7500 and multiply that times your commission split. Let's say you're on a 70-30 split and you get 70. That's going to be times 70%, 5,250. How many people does the average person know? 15. How many leads can you get from this, these 15 people? probably 10. What's the lifetime value of this? It's $52,500. That's the lifetime value of a customer at $250,000 average price range. So rather than be transactional and go for this, what we're suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, 
is you understand that this is a long-term venture. It's lifetime value. What is each customer worth? And once you calculate that, then you can start looking at what your ads are going to do. So let's go into this quickly. Marketing is a process of building your business and integrating it. Okay. This is the four step marketing formula. The first step that we suggest you use is this one. Oops. <laughs> okay. So let's say you're in an airport. You've just come off a long flight. You're staying at baggage claim. You're kind of tired. You're waiting for your luggage. You think about getting to the car, getting the luggage in the car, driving home, and all these things are going through your mind. You might be thinking about the vacation and the great times you had. Anyway, you're fairly preoccupied. This is what's called alpha mode. You're pretty much relaxed and in your own little world, not paying much attention. And then across the way, you hear someone calling your name. Well, what happens typically is you snap out of alpha mode, you go into beta mode. And beta is when you're alert and you're awake and you're looking around and you look across the airport and you see someone calling your name again and you look and you go, who is this person and why are they calling me? And you're looking across the airport and then you see this couple over there and they're greeting each other. They're hugging and kissing and they're really happy. And they go, oh, they were, she was calling his name or he was calling her name, whichever the case may be. It has nothing to do with me. But what happens is the beta shuts down. You go back into alpha state. So what the interrupt is designed to do is exactly that. It's designed to interrupt the person, your target market. There's several ways to interrupt people. And you see this all the time in marketing. So as you're watching television or whatever media you use to get information, start looking at these ads and see if you can figure out what they're doing and how they're doing. So the first thing typically that people will use when they're running ads is they want to show you something you already know. So they're going to show you something familiar. So what's familiar that interrupts? Well, you're going to see it all the time. <laughs> One is animals. So here are some interrupters you may see. You have lizards, which are called geckos, which I guess is for Geico, uh, butterflies, Lunesta and Microsoft, horses, Budweiser, tigers, Tony and Exxon Mobil, and Wheaties, cereal, fish, Charlie the Tuna, bears, Coca-Cola, rabbits, Energizer batteries, ducks, Aflac, dogs, several, cats, several more. You get the idea. So this is something familiar. You go, oh, look, a puppy dog. <laughs> Let's watch this commercial. Oh, look, there's the horses at Christmas. Look at the poor in the sleigh. Oh, I'm getting me a Coke. <laughs> They work. It's Madison Avenue, create and repeat, create and repeat, create and repeat, brand it into people's brains. Like we used to brand cattle. Now it's all marketing, branded, branded, branded. That's where the term comes from. The other thing that's familiar is celebrities. So you look up, you're watching TV, some you look up, you see the Tiger Woods, you know, one of the world's most greatest golfers ever. You go, wow, what's Tiger doing on my television? Let's see what he has to say. You watch him, Tiger climbs into a Buick. You know, Tiger doesn't drive a Buick, right? <laughs> I don't think Tiger even drives. <laughs> so you snap out of this alpha state you're in, you know, a commercial. You see Tiger Woods, you go into beta mode. And then after the commercial, you go right back to what you were doing before, ignoring the television. <laughs> anyway, Cindy Crawford, Sophia Bar. Vergara do room rooms to go. I don't know if Sophia's still there. Rooms to go. Samuel Jackson really doesn't care what's in your wallet. Uh, Jennifer Aston does a vino and smart water. You see Halle Berry with Revlon, Peyton Manning doing direct TV and Papa John's pizza and Cam Newton does yogurt and on and on it goes using something familiar. So they to interrupt a lot of these advertisers will use something familiar like either animals or celebrities. The other thing, a way to interrupt is using things that are unusual. 
You have events in your life that you remember more, most distinctly and the clearest are special, unique events like your first date, your first kiss, your first class, your first car, your first child, your first marriage. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Something unique. People remember where they were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Don Kennedy, Martin Luther King, all these great politicians, wonderful world leaders. We know where we were when that happened. Most people know exactly where they were and what they were doing on 9-11. Most people know and experience these tragic events, either these unusual events, some tragic, some pleasant, and some that you know we really strive for and live for, and some we regret and wish we didn't have to go through. But these are unusual events, and oftentimes advertisers will use unusual things to also interrupt you. Um, the last one is problematic. So to me, the, <laughs> here, here we go, right? I don't know why I can't get these things to stay in my ear. It's probably some form of user error. Nonetheless, the third way is, bear with me, please. Thank you. Um, problematic. So to me, a business has three purposes. The first one is to give you your life. And for you new realtors watching this, please design your life. If you don't, someone be happy to do it for you. And the purpose of real estate, this business you're building, is to give you your life. Most agents I see and brokers give their lives to the business. The business will not respond in kind. So please don't do that. Design it to give you your life. So that's number one purpose of a business from my point of view. The second one is to pro solve a problem. And the third is to add value. And so these are the three purposes of a business. And marketing, I like solving problems. So I like telling people what's, why real estate's the best business in the world. And there are 12 reasons why. And I love this business. I've done very well at it. I love getting paid by helping other people. It's a great business to be in. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, you know, I don't have those skills to, to go do that, but I can't help other people. And so that's one of the great things about real estate. So when we're solving problems, that's how I like to structure my marketing. Even though it's the best business in the world, there are problems in it. One is the attrition rate, as I've already told you. If you've got 80, 90% failing in the first 12, 18 months, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And our whole curriculum and everything we do is structured to teach people how to get up and running into the closing table faster. That's a problem we're solving, the attrition rate. How to get up and running fast, how to start making money. If you, if you talk to a school that tells you you need six months of income to get started, you're talking to the wrong school. You don't need six months. We'll get you up and running in 10 days if you're committed and coachable and follow the formula. It's not that hard. It's not that complex and difficult. I shouldn't say hard. It is hard. Actually, the business takes work. You've got to be committed and coachable. But it's not complex. It's not difficult. It's really simple. So this is the problem. So when you're looking at your marketing, what problems do buyers have during the process of selecting a real estate agent? a lender, an inspector, and an attorney when they want to buy a home because they're going to need all of those. Who's going to educate them? Who's going to tell them beforehand what to look for and what to look out for? Do we avoid problems or do we try to figure out how to solve them after we get into them? How do buyers ensure they're not paying too much for the property and that the property they're purchasing is in good condition? Are they getting the best loan available? Is the inspector experienced and finding everything wrong with the house? Or did they miss something big? Is their attorney reviewing the contract, the survey, and the title commitment, looking for problems that could result in major financial problems down the road? Every contract I do, I have my attorney look at it for these things, survey, title commitment, and every now and then they find something. Same thing with, I mean, <laughs> same thing with sellers. They've got problems too. So if you're running an ad for buyers, then you may use an interrupt headline. It'll get their attention. Like, for example, in this, it's either unusual, it's familiar, unusual, or problematic. 
These are the things we're looking for to start the ad. And then we write, based on that, we write the headline. So we have four, four steps, interrupt, engage, educate, offer. And the interrupt, we're looking for something familiar, something unusual, or problematic. And from there, we get our headlines. For example, <laughs> here's a headline. I knew I should have had that home inspected. Uh, what happened here? <clears throat> this is an interrupt. I didn't know that paying off my debt would hurt my credit. Did you know that? But actually, it will. I thought my tolly policy covered that. <laughs> What septic inspection? <laughs> Can you imagine seeing a headline that says, what septic inspection? <laughs> you know, right then, there's a problem. The startups have problems too. So do properties sit on the market too long? And are they not staged properly? They have limited access. In other words, no lockbox, appointment only, available for showing everywhere over the Wednesday between 3 and 4 a.m. when the moon is full. I mean, come on. Agents are going to flow like water to the easiest deal. You've got to make that property accessible. You've got to make it easy for the other agent to bring in their buyer and do business with you. I'm talking to you listing agents out there. Make it easy. Stop hiding the lockboxes. If that thing is vacant, why are you making me make an appointment? Why is it appointment only if it's vacant? Open it up and let me in. Help me help you. <laughs> Has it been 20 years since it was updated? Does the price reflect this? Does a listing agent put a sign in the front yard and a lot box on the garage door and disappear and wait for an offer? Or do they proactively market to the two pools of buyers? So when you're listing a property, you're going to have two pools of buyers. The other agents that are in the board of realtors with you who have buyers and the buyers who don't have agents. So you need a marketing campaign for both. So typically I like using problems, problematic headlines to get their attention because we want to avoid problems. We want to solve them. We want to educate people about what we do, how we do it, why we do it that way. And more importantly, the benefit to them of allowing us to represent them. So here's some examples of some headlines that I wrote. What do you mean my buyer flipped my house? <laughs> my pool is in the easement? What's an easement? <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to disclose that. <laughs> What's septic inspection? <laughs> so those are some headlines. The great thing about email is you get two headlines. Your subject line is the first headline. If they see that, if their subject line is weak, they're not going to open it. They probably do the same thing. Most people are doing the same thing with the emails, right? Delete, delete, delete. delete. Oh, there's a subject line. That's interesting. What's septic inspection? What is that guy? What happened? <laughs> so we want to, to me, I like this one the best. I just like solving problems. I like teaching people about what to do, how to do it how to take advantage of it, how to solve a problem, what they are, how to avoid them, what we do that makes it easier to get up and running and get to the closing table quickly. That's really what we're the best at. The next step is once you interrupt, is you got to very quickly go to this next step. You've got to engage them right away. Your sub headline has got to pull fast because if they hear someone call, if you hear someone calling your name and you look up and see it's not you, you go right back to what were you doing. Same thing with an ad. If they see the subject line, the, the uh, headline, and it doesn't resonate, or if it resonates and they go look for more proof or something, up to, they're trying to stay engaged. If you don't engage them, they'll check out. So your head, your sub headline. It's almost as important as your interrupt headline. You've got to engage them quickly. So this is where you ask, answer the question, what's in it for me? Why should I do business with you? Why should I give you my money? You've got to engage them quickly. It's a sub headline. So we make this offer 
it's an offer to add to to begin the educational process and to add valuable relevant information that solves the problem we refer to in the headline you've got to engage them quickly once we interrupt them and then we engage them then we can start the process and this is the body of the ad this is when we become position ourselves as the experts we become the fountain from which all information flows so this is when we start and we tell the story. We educate them about, again, what we do, how we do it, why we do it that way, and the benefit to them. So again, I'm going to ask you, what business are you in? And if you don't have an educational component, you're going to be missing, dropping leads and missing sales. So this is, this is the interrupt is to get their attention, and the engage is to make them curious. And this is where we pour out the information. If you have an inferior product or service, the best thing you could have is an uneducated customer. If you have a valuable product or service that actually adds value, solves problems, helps people get on with their lives, that helps them be, do, or have whatever they want, then the best thing you could have is an educated customer. Because an uneducated customer doesn't know the difference. They'll default to price thinking, because they're always looking for some reason to make a decision. They're looking for a difference. They're asking themselves, what makes you unique? What makes you special? Why should I do business with you? If you don't tell them, they'll default to price. Same thing you do when you're shopping. So teach them how to buy. Teach them how to sell. This is where I went through. And, and my strength right here when I was in brokerage was the for sale by owner. And the reason why is because they were an identified source. I used to get them out of the newspaper. That newspaper back then it actually was paper. It had news in it. Weird, right? <laughs> So you, they were listed in the back in the real estate section. The newspaper was only a quarter. So for 25 cents, I get a list of all these people. It's got their addresses. It's got everything. They're motivated sellers. They obviously want to sell. It says for sell. They just don't want to work with a realtor. Why? Well, they had a bad experience with one or one didn't educate them. A FISBO typically is an uneducated consumer. Their former agent, if they have one, did not tell them what they did, how they did it, why they did it that way to get the home sold in 30 days within 98% of asking price. That happened. And the realtor didn't tell them all the things they did. They didn't educate them. So the FISBO looks in the front yard and they see the sign. They see the lot box on the garage door. In 30 days, the home sold and gone. They don't hear from the agent. They'll go, how hard could it be? Signs, you know, five bucks at Home Depot. Lockbox is twenty-five bucks for thirty bucks. I could have saved fifteen grand, or ten, or five, or whatever the number is. It's a lot more than the sign in the lockbox. And so this is why we have to have an educational component in our marketing to educate people about why we are the obvious choice. And so this is what I told the FISBOs. I'm the only broker in the state that's going to help you sell your home without a broker. I immediately separate myself from every other agent that wants a listing. They go, what? Yes. Why would you do that? Well, good question. The reason I do that is because 98% of the people who list the home or market the home themselves without a professional realtor, they ultimately end up listing with a broker. So all I'm asking is an exchange. If and when you, if your home doesn't sell, and if and when you get to the point where you want to interview some brokers and see what they offer, I'd like to be one of the one, uh, few that you interview. Is that okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Fine. I'll tell you how to sell it. Here's what you do. And I tell them. I give them a brochure. It's got all this information in there. How to do this, how to do everything. It's all in there. I told them. <laughs> then I ask them, do you mind if I stay in touch? Uh, no, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. I'll see you next week. A week? <laughs> yeah, a week. I'll be back. Okay, hurry. <laughs> I didn't show up asking for anything. I'm just giving them free information. It's valuable. It works. I know. I've sold hundreds of houses. And so this is the marketing campaign. Interrupt, engage, educate. Teach them how to consume your product or service. How to establish value in the industry. How do you hire a real estate agent? All real estates are not created equal. There's your headline. Here's how to choose a realtor. Here's how to choose someone to represent you. 
how to get top dollar for your home in 30 days or less without a broker. <laughs> how to buy property with no money and no credit. <laughs> how to take advantage of insider trading using a realtor. Insider trading is legal in real estate. I'm not suggesting anyone break the law. What I'm saying is I'm a licensed real estate broker in the state of Texas. I have access to multiple listing service. That's where most of the deals are. Most of the best properties I bought were in MLS. The public doesn't have access to that. That's an insider trading job. It's legal insider trading. I'm not suggesting anyone break a law here. What I'm saying is I have access to information the public doesn't have. The other thing that's in MLS are, the so are all the properties that have sold. Why don't more people invest? They don't know how to attach value to the asset. And if you pay too much and borrow too much, it's nothing anyone can do for you. So what's in MLS are the sold comparables. So I know pretty much the range of what that subject property is worth. So these are all the reasons that you need an educated professional to guide you through the, the disposition or the acquisition of property, selling or buying. You pick with somebody who really knows how to do it. And that's your best asset. It's like having a great doctor, a great chiropractor, a great sports medicine doctor, a great golf coach, <laughs> a great attorney, a great accountant. You need this team of professionals. So realtors, you need to be professionals and teach people what you do, how you do it, what makes you special, what makes you unique, what makes you valuable. You do that when you educate them. They don't know. And once they know, you go, what are the 150 things you're going to do to sell that house? If you tell them, they go, holy mackerel, that much? <laughs> yeah, it's hard, really. I wasn't sold. It was pretty easy. Really? How do you know? Well, they put a sign in the front yard and a lockbox on the door, and 30 days later, we went to closing. It was pretty simple. The realtor never told them everything they did to sell it. So I'm suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, is you make this a core part of your business. Educate, educate, educate. Tell them what you do. Your, your website should be content rich. How to do it without you. Trust me, they're not going to take out their own appendix. They're not going to pull their own teeth. They're not going to crack their own back. They're not going to sell their own lawsuits. They're not going to do their own taxes. They need a realtor. They just don't know why. So my position is if you'll take the time to create a marketing campaign that solves their problems or helps them avoid them, then you, they'll perceive you as the obvious choice, an educated professional who's experienced, accomplished, successful, knows what you're doing, and can help them through this difficult transaction. And they're getting more difficult by the day. And help them with taxes and property values and decorating and updating and, and coaching them and counseling them and helping them. That's where the gold is. So this is the most important part in my mind of the four step process is you want to interrupt them. You want to engage them, but to educate, once you've done those two, educate them. Okay, enough on that. The last one is, this is a call to action, also known as call to action. Click here, learn more, go here, download this, download that, come to my open house, download the report, something um, that's a call to action. We want to compel them to take action. So if your interrupt is strong and works, your engage works, your educate the body works, then you make this offer. Remember, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> You're a salesman. They don't want to buy a house. They don't want to be dragged all over hell's half acre. <laughs> they don't want to. They just want the information. So don't hold the information hostage. I get on these sites sometimes. Join here. Sign up. No, I don't want to. I don't even want your emails. I just want to poke around and look. If I want to engage, I'll let you know. So I just check out. I won't do it. I will not exchange an email for information. I won't. I just, I got, look. I have 16,859 unopened emails in my inbox right now. I don't need any more. If I want to talk to you, I'll engage. Uh, yes, guess what I'm doing after this? <laughs> delete, 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 delete. <laughs> 
They don't want to talk to us. They don't want to talk to you. I know you're cool and special. I'm sure you're a wonderful person, but, but, but they don't want to talk to us. They don't want to talk to us. So what do we do? We offer them a really easy, low risk way to get all the information they want from us and let them engage when they want to. Why? Because that's what they want to do. Sound familiar? All right. So there's your call to action. So now in your offer, you lead them or link them to the, the, these articles that are on your website. And if I were in brokerage today, I'm not, but if I was, I would have two sides to my site. I would put buyers enter here and sellers enter here. I would split it. And you have all these articles full of content. Your site should be content rich. We have five videos on our homepage. That's content. We're doing our best to convey the messages to people considering getting into real estate. What are the pitfalls? What are the problems? How do I choose a school? How do I choose a broker? What makes you different? What makes you unique? What am I going to learn? So this is what we tell them. Here's what you need to know. This is what the, our whole function book is about. This is it. How to get rich in real estate and have a life. What brokers want you to know that most schools don't teach. It's an education. This is our brochure. This is our business card. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is why we do it that way. So what we are, it's a business school for realtors. Why? Because real estate's a business. It's not a job or a career. Your clients expect you to have a business education, marketing, sales, negotiations, putting a team together. No one succeeds alone. You're only as good as your team. So these are the business schools that we te skills that we teach. These are the problems that we solve. So you, I'm asking and suggesting you do the same thing. If you have buyers, go to your lenders, go to your title companies. You should have lenders and title companies. They're asking you for business or well, ask them for information about what are the newest loan programs coming out? What are we doing up to, to lower interest rates when they've jumped, when they've doubled or tripled and priced some home buyers out of the market? What's the solution to that problem? Solve that problem and you'll sell more houses. What problems are sellers having getting these homes? Because their homes are overpriced because the rates were so low. See, this is America. It's not how much, it's how much a month. You make me like it, show me where to cram it in my budget, I'll take it. It's mainly with homes. So if people are on fixed incomes and interest rates double or triple, next thing you know, they can't afford the home that they fell in love with. It makes them heart sick. Well, how can we solve that problem? Well, sellers, you know, we're being told, just reduce your price. Why don't you just take the differential and buy down the rate? <laughs> Since we know the problem is payment, people don't buy houses. They buy payment. Well, they buy the house, but the payment is the linchpin. If the, if the financing doesn't work, the deal doesn't make. None of the home has to appraise and all that. I get it all. What I'm suggesting is that most people are interest rate sensitive except on credit cards. Don't get me started. So how do we make the home fit their budget? What can buyers do? What can lenders do? What can sellers do? Well, you can buy down that rate, just buy it down. You take a block of money instead of reducing your sales price, just pay it to the lender in form of prepaid interest. In exchange, they'll give your buyer a lower rate. Now the house becomes affordable. Now you get your deal done. You're going to give the money away anyway. Why just reduce the price when it doesn't make it affordable? It doesn't solve the problem. So there's all kinds of ways to do this. There's over 100 ways to finance a house. And so this is how you become valuable to the industry. You make a low-risk offer, an easy way for them to get this information without having to talk to you. And once you do all this and teach them and educate them, you position yourself as the obvious choice. Now they want to engage. They go, I hope I can get that guy. I hope I can get that person to represent me. I hope she's available. That's what they're going to think. Same thing we do when we shop. 
Okay, so that's it. So what do you look for? What are the problems and pitfalls? How do you find an attorney? How do you find a, an inspector? I mean, I've had, I've had some agents say, you know what? I got some buyers coming in town. I hope they find a good inspector. I said, what are you talking about? Choose your inspector. No, I don't want to get sued. I don't want my broker said no, not to refer our inspector. We don't want that liability. What? Liability? Look, this is what I told my clients. When you engage with me, when you hire me to represent you by signing that form, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lend you my personal team. I have a team of lawyers, lenders, inspectors, everything that we need to get this transaction done. Contractors, make ready guys, stagers, furniture people, contractors, subcontractors. We got everything you need to get this thing done turnkey. It's a system. It's an assembly line. It's all set up. We'll just put you on it. We refer. Damn right. We refer them to everybody. I'm not going to throw these people out there and hope they find somebody. No, 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 no. You can't leave them twisting in the wind. You got to educate them and micromanage this project. There's too many missing. There's too many steps in it to miss one. Right? So you've got to micromanage this and tell them every time you go through it. You put this house on the market. You've got this 100, 125, 150. I don't know how many you have. We had about 150 steps that would take to get that thing sold. We would tell them. If we don't do what we, what we told you we would do, if we don't do it, tell you we did it, and show you we did it, you can fire us with a phone call. It's the easy exit listing guarantee. That reduces their risk. And then every time we did something, we'd email them. Your property has been put in MLS. The inspection has been completed. Here's what we need to go and sit down with them, show them. Do the inspection before you put it on the market. <laughs> Why? Because the buyers are going to renegotiate with the seller. They're going to hire an inspector and try to find everything wrong with that house that they can. The more they like it, the more detailed the inspection is going to be. So they can renegotiate the sales price. To keep your seller from renegotiating with the buyer, do the inspection up front. I didn't fix it all. Don't give the buyer any reason to negotiate with you. This is the way you represent your sellers and teach them this and educate them. Talk to these FISBOs, okay? Go talk to them. Have you had a home inspected? No, we don't have a buyer yet. Get inspected now. Why would I do that? Great question. Here's why. You don't want to negotiate your price down. No. Do you? No. Well, okay. Get it inspected and fix everything. Ah, oh, good idea. Yeah, I got about 20 more like that. You want to hear them? Yeah, okay. I'll be back next week. Next week? <laughs> Tell me today. No, next week. <laughs> so you see how fun it gets? You just write the ad. Interrupt, engage, educate, offer. They have to have a clearinghouse they can go to. Your website, content rich. This information is available everywhere. All right, I hope this helps. Okay. Uh, here's some examples that So they come to the site, you give them a few articles, and then ask for the email. Once they've given, once I've gotten some information, I'll give up an email. I just don't want to give it up up front. So get their email and then start emailing. Here's some things you could send to the client. The six biggest mistakes home buyers make and how to avoid them. The four questions you must ask every real estate agent before you hire them. 99 ways to sell your home for top dollar in 30 days or less without a broker. How to get a home regardless of your credit rating. How to get a great deal on a fixer upper. How to see the newest, freshest, hottest listings first before they hit the market. And here's some, here's, here's something to give people to choose you. Uh, six questions ask you for how to choose a realtor, how to choose a buyer's agent. How to use insider trading legally. Seven reasons why real estate's the best investment, period. And then go through this process. Interrupt, engage, educate, offer. Last thing I want to give you is this. I'm going to give you a way to test your marketing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please test your marketing before you send it out. Here's some questions I'm going to ask you to look at, email me info at buildmyrebusiness.com if you want this test and I'll send it to you. 
You can test your marketing. Question number one, what makes you unique? You can't say service. Stop saying service. You can't say service. It's a vague, ambiguous term that means nothing to anyone. <clears throat> it's been used, overused and misused to the point where it has no meaning whatsoever. If your title rep says, please do business with me, you go, why? They go, we have great service. Don't do business with them. Because <laughs> that's not the reason. They don't even know what it means. Neither do you. We none of us do. What, what does good service mean? Well, you know it when you experience it, but how do you define it? So what makes you unique? That's question number one. Number two, why should I do business with you? Look at your ad and read it. Does it answer the question, why should I do business with you? Number three, is what you're saying believable? Number four, is your message filled with I, me, mine, our, and us words? Remember, it's not about you. How great you are, how experienced you are, how wonderful you are, how whatever you are, you are. It's about them. You want to solve their problem. Who else can say what you say? I'm not saying they can do what you do. I'm just saying, can they say it? And here's a way to test that is you take your ad, you take your name off of it, you put someone else's name on it. Does the ad still work? If that still works, throw the ad away because it doesn't work. That's the question. Who else can say what you say? See, no one else can say what I'm saying. Get your license, learn to use it because it's not what they teach. Hmm. It's unique. So I say, get your license, learn to use it. What does that mean? What it means is, I'll explain what it means. It's education. After they're educated, they choose somebody else, they choose someone else, but at least they're educated. They know why they made a dumb mistake. <laughs> Number six, is there an offer? Seven, is it educational? Eight, is it filled with adjectives, generalities, and platitudes, or facts, figures, and statistics that make your point credible? Do you take a uh, nine? Do you take credit for things you're supposed to do? See, a lot of these ads, I'm like, I read them, I go, well, I would hope so. We offer a guarantee. Well, I would hope so. We'll fix it right and take your car in it, right? I'm trying, get, I'm trying to get a car fixed. Time for a checkup. We fix it right the first time. <laughs> well, I would hope so. <laughs> so if you read your ad and you say, well, I would hope so, the ad fails. It doesn't pass. Do you measure your results? You should have a way to measure that ad. When you make this offer, you have to know how many people download this report. Who are they? Where'd they come from? Where'd they go to? Are, you, are they in your drip campaign? Is it automated CRM where you now drip them? You should be dripping to them. Okay. Uh, what conclusion, number 11, what conclusion do you want them to come to? 12, is there a direct response trigger or a call, call to action? If so, what is it? And 13, is it follow the four-step marketing formula? You need to ask the questions when you're on these ads. Otherwise, like I said the other day, half of my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. When you do this, you'll know which half is wasted, and you won't waste it anymore. Then I have a test here for you. It's a real estate uh, marketing uh, uh, formula. It's a test, and we, we test the ad. So is there a headline? Yeah, points and everything, and it's very sophisticated. So the interrupt, is there a headline? Yes or no. Is it relevant to the target market? Yes or no. Is it familiar? I knew your problem with none of these. So you can actually score your ad before you run it. So you grade it and you score it, and you have the educate part and the offer part, and then all the details. So then you have to score it. 19 to 17, it's a great ad. 16 to 10, it's an okay ad. Here's what to do. If it's below that, it so explains what to do and how to do it and how to run your ads. So I hope that's helpful. Interrupt, engage, educate, offer. If you need any of this, email me, info at buildmyrebusiness.com. Or just send a message here. Somebody will get back to you. And be happy to send this to you. Thank you again for your time. This has been Wednesday. I'm, I've been Wayne. <laughs> and this has been a great event. Thank you for showing up.
I'll see you next week, 9 a.m. Remember, you were born a genius and meant to be incredible success. Let's go out and make it a better world. See you next Wednesday. Bye. Ha, 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 ha.